What is up my aesthetic boys? It's Fresh, back with another video. In this story time video, be ready for discussions of Meat Space, Cadillacs, Jacuzzi, and all of the best malicious compliance. Want me to go to church even though I'm an atheist? Thou shalt learn the hard way. I was probably 11 or 12 when I gave up believing in God. I had tried to get saved multiple times and felt nothing each time, and to my kid brain, that was enough evidence that he didn't exist. My dad was the type who went to church on Sunday morning, night, and went to Wednesday night revivals. Needless to say, he got a bit fussed at me for being so blasphemous. He told me that he planned on dragging me to church until I knew God. Okay dad, go ahead. I was, and still am, a calculating little bugger. I didn't put up a fight when he said I had no choice but to go to church because I expected his reaction and had already formed a plan. Sunday arrives. First thing as we walk through the door, two little old ladies LOLs, ask dad and I what God's done for us lately. Dad responds, now it's my turn. Me. I don't believe in God, so I don't think he's done anything for us. I got all A's on my report card though, so I'm doing well for myself something along those lines and definitely less articulate little old ladies hey you most certainly believe in god how could you say that me no really i don't but i still think lying is bad so i'm telling you i don't think he's actually real y'all don't want me to lie in here do ya looks around suspiciously as if god himself were eavesdropping they were appalled I got whooped real good later, but it was 100% worth it because he had no argument. My dad never dragged me to church again. Did he really expect me to lie in the house of the savior? Pfft. You know, part of me doesn't want to believe that this is real. This seems fantastic in a lot of ways as far as, uh, oh, that would have been so great if I had done that kind of recollective way. But at the same time, 11 year olds really can be conniving and snarky and real smart asses in a whole bunch of ways so at the same time i don't doubt that this happened at all i mean if anything op was just following the bible like i'm pretty sure corinthians 21 64 says thou shalt not within the house of the lord lie or otherwise deceive your elders for he who created our vast landscape of bountiful pleasures from the rolling seas to the doritos bag in your hand Shall therefore not be disrespected by a little prepubescent smartass, am I right? I, I think that's in the Bible. I, I think. Bad high school English teacher wants me to pronounce like she does and gets fired because of it. Background. I'm from Spain and public schools in Spain have a painfully low level of English. By painfully low, I mean third year teachers don't know what a snake is. In my local area, teachers are tested on their skill through three chosen elite students from three different years to check their teaching competence. If all three do a mediocre job in the test, the teacher gets fired. Well, usually not fired, just forced to take a course or something. I was not a bratty kid, so despite having passed the CAE with an A at age 14, I was respectful to my horrible English teachers, always asked for permission to do things, and would have helped them if asked. Hence the perfect grades that irked my English teachers so much. So one day in my third, before I scurry off to my next, my beloved English teacher stops me and tells me that I've been chosen as her third year representative. She was finally, finally getting tested. I've been yearning for this. Teacher, during your speaking test, remember to pronounce just as I've taught you. You have a tendency to drift from my teachings and I cannot have that rebellious attitude of yours affect my career. Speaking is the one thing that I'm best at, mind you. But at our school, every adult's favorite sentence was, the teacher is always right, and if they're not, you better believe they are. I'm not fond of this translation, I feel like it doesn't get the oppression across quite like the original. So since talking back would end badly for me, I shut up and agreed. I mulled this over, and as the test drew closer, I decided that why the hell not make this pathetic excuse for an English teacher take an extra course or two on her own damn subject and teaching as a whole. Believe me, the Spanish English teachers I've had in my public schools have, with one exception, been absolutely terrible. The day of the test came. I was ready to comply with my dear teacher's command. I went in and the natives at the examination center actually recognized me from last time, about a year before the story takes place. 
They seem happy that I'm my teacher's chosen third year since they've had to condemn every other sorry excuse for a teacher that day to do several courses. I inform them that there's no need to worry and I'm gonna do exactly what my teacher taught me as per her request. They look confused at first until the speaking test comes and one of them asks me the first question. My English was so butchered he could barely understand me and the Spanish pronunciation was so strong that it bothered his ears. Trust me, it hurts to hear. Next Monday, I'm informed that my absolute favorite teacher has been fired in light of her newly discovered incompetence and that the others will be investigated. I rejoiced. Every other student who was good at English also rejoiced. It was a happy day. In case any of you were wondering, OP later adds that in particular the word that she butchered the pronunciation was instead of saying donut spelled fully, her teacher would say Duthna, which unless I'm sorely mistaken, and a popular brewery from a mainstream American cartoon sitcom starring a whole bunch of yellow people has started to expand their product line into cashews, well, I don't think that pronunciation is entirely correct. Man, that's some toe luck there, OP, that you got stuck with such horrible English teachers. Although you faced adversity, I'm glad you were able to overcome it. 3 plus 3 plus 1.5 equals, well, all you're getting is a half hour. Tops. Years ago, one of my employer's clients decided to set up a new office in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I got chosen to spend three weeks there getting the new space set up. Also chosen for the job was a guy from another division's Chicago office, Dave. I've never worked with Dave before, but from the start, I didn't like him much. He was never less than 15 minutes late, he lumbered like a zombie, and I caught him dozing off more than a few times during the first week on site. Still, he was the closest thing I had to a friend in Fort Wayne, so I invited him out to the bar on Friday for all the company-funded booze we could drink. I wish, he said. I'm going home and passing out until Monday. The commute has been killing me. Wait, what? It seems Dave's boss has been a dick, and instead of paying for a plane ticket, hotel, and rental car like my boss had, he'd instructed Dave to drive. From Chicago, almost three hours away. Dude, that's like, totally no bueno. Six hours a day just driving? Yeah man, it sucks. Still, it'd be killer money. That puts you at what, like 70 hours a week? Jeez. Make sure you put in for your gas and tolls quick though, the last time I had to get reimbursed for expenses it took him over a month. I could see what little light Dave's eyes held faded. Dave, they're not paying for any of that. Hearing that, I put in a call to my boss, who was as puzzled as I was. If he'd worked for our division, he'd be paid for his drive time and expenses at least, and we were both pretty sure it was corporate edict and not something individual divisions could choose not to obey. Unfortunately. Neither I nor my boss had any say in the matter, and neither of us were familiar with Illinois or Indiana labor law, so all we could do was advise Dave to save his receipts for the IRS and then complain to HR. On Monday, Dave was late again. After an hour, I was worried and called his phone. Dave, I just passed Portage, making pretty good time all things considered. I should be there in about two hours. Dave sounded perfectly happy about it, so I figured he'd been required to stop into his office before heading out for some reason. Okay, Dave. I'll see you then. When Dave arrived a little after 11, the first thing he did was take a 15-minute break. Long drive, I understood. There was still most of the day ahead of us, and after the break, Dave finally got down to business booting up his computer. He had barely logged in when he stood up and announced he was taking his lunch. Okay. Something was going on, but I hadn't the foggiest idea what. After lunch, Dave finally got around to some work, putting in a good 20 minutes of reading emails before stopping by to see me. I'm gonna take my second 15 now, then I'm heading home. Uh, what? Dave grinning like a nut. <laughs> Don't worry, I spoke to HR over the weekend. I didn't see Dave on Tuesday. His cell phone was going unanswered, and neither my boss or I had any luck in finding out why. We didn't try hard. Not our zoo and not our monkey, after all. Ditto for Wednesday, but whatever. He's probably just sick. And then, on Thursday, I see Dave, before work, at the hotel breakfast buffet. Dave, I was getting worried when you were a no-show the last two days. Dave laughed a little, and after we piled our plates with bad scrambled eggs and burnt sausages, he told me a story. On Monday, the client had noticed him coming in late, doing no work and leaving early, and called their company to complain. 
Dave, in turn, was called into a disciplinary meeting with his boss and local HR, who were prepared to terminate him over putting in for 32 hours of unearned overtime the previous week and not working at all the day before. Dave said they were serious, too. One of the guys from building security interrupted the meeting to deliver a box containing the personal effects from his desk. Dave had an ace, though. Well, three aces. An email from his boss instructing him to drive to Fort Wayne every day at his own expense as a change in work location, one. An email from corporate HR telling him that while he wasn't required to work overtime, he was required to report any overtime worked, including driving to or from a client, two and a page from his division's employee manual, 3, which covered paid breaks off-site. He then informed them that he was not working any more overtime, and after driving three hours in, one and a half hours of breaks, and three hours home, it left him with just a half an hour a day to do actual work. Less, actually, if the traffic was bad. Oh, and the corporate HR was willing to stand behind him on it. He'd just spoken to them before the meeting. Dave. It took them about three seconds to realize they were screwed, and well, here I am, back in action. And since everything was booked last minute, I'm in a suite with a jacuzzi, and my rental is a damn Cadillac. Uh, for some reason, this entire story reminds me of a certain scene from the first Incredibles movie, in which Bob Parr is called into his boss's office, and Bob Parr asks his boss, are you saying we shouldn't be trying to help our customers? And his boss, through clenched teeth, in this case, the HR of the story, says, the law requires that I say no. I don't think that HR or any kind of administration within the bureaucracy of whatever whack company this is actually cares about Dave, his time off, or how much they really have to pay him. They care about the big money, the legal liability of the situation. And if they realize that they've been doing something illegal, violating whatever labor laws or contractual obligations they have to this employee, you best believe they're going to get on his side in a hurry. I think a jacuzzi suite and a Cadillac are the least they could do for our poor man Dave who had previously been commuting six hours a day of theoretically unpaid overtime for this stupid job. Here's that printout you wanted, sir. All 400 pages of it. If you've ever read some of my previous posts, you know that I work IT and software development at an engineering firm in the city of country music and tourists in cowboy hats. Nashville? Question mark? Anyway. Last month, we hired a new sales guy. He's young, over-enthusiastic. I shall call him Young Buck. Young Buck thinks he knows everything, yet every time I try to explain something to him, even at the most basic level, the inner machinations of the customizable software package we offer to customers, it's as if I'm shooting a laser into a black hole. I've had to show him how to minimize a window on his computer. So when he asked me, one morning last week, to print out the source code for our software so he could read it, I of course asked him to repeat himself, as I was unsure if I had heard him correctly. Yes, I need to understand this thoroughly so I can sell it to our customers. You want more billable hours, don't you? Yeah, I don't make commissions like you do, but those always look good on my review. A printout, however, would be a bad idea. I could show you how to open the files with Notepad if you- I'd rather have something physical. Now, there are a few things to note about our software package's source code. It's been cobbled together from years of development, even before my time, though I've refactored and rewritten most of it. There are 14 teen main modules, which I customize and deploy according to our customers' needs. The base source code is just a genericized version. We almost never deploy all the modules, so the packages we deliver are usually simpler. With all the base code, which I might add is heavily and meticulously commented and documented, the printout would easily reach 400 pages. There's reason one. Reason two would be that our source code is trade secret, and for the sake of the company, I don't want it floating around in meat space. I think that means to say meta space, but I think that meat space sounds funnier. I try to convey both of these to young Buck. I could almost see my words shooting right out the opposite ear. He did not like it when I told him I would not do it. No, he did not. So I was already half expecting it when the general manager called me. The current general manager is in his 60s. Balding, bespectacled, but with an imposing build, talks with words clipped by a northern Midwest US accent. Iris, Young Buck is telling me you won't print out the source code for him. Yes, and that's because- Iris, we take cooperation very seriously at this company. You need to cooperate with sales so they can sell your product alongside our projects. Uh, but that's not a good idea be- Listen, I don't want excuses. We need more sales. Just get on it. And make me a copy too, it sounds interesting. 
Now, Young Buck is computer illiterate. General Manager is twice as bad. They're fine people, good at what they do, but they would see my source code as eldritch runes in a necronomicon. Alright, time for some malicious compliance. Can I get that in an email, then? Two minutes later, the email appears in my inbox. I save it and print myself a copy. Then, I open Visual Studio, open my base code project, open the main class, print. MSSQL handler, print. TCP handler, print. LPC handler, print. TCP listener, print. Oracle handler, print. ZPL, EPL, IPL handler, print. Main logic loop, print. The code behind for the interface, print. The WinForms designer for the interface, print. I ran out of paper twice before I had one copy ready. The final product was pushing two inches thick and made quite a satisfying thump as I set it down on the general manager's desk. I wish, dear reader, you could have seen his face when he realized what he'd asked for. I never ended up printing a second copy. General manager shredded his copy because I had flabbergasted him enough to be able to explain, without interruption, that the source code was a trade secret and reassured him that it's on our network drive anyway. I gave both him and Young Buck access to the folder as per a second email request. In 10 days since, nobody has accessed that folder but myself. Man, how many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? Look, I get that people are technologically illiterate, at least they're not incompetent. This is mildly irritating because someone with power over you, even the salesperson who has some power as far as encouraged cooperation goes. They're trying to explain to you how to do your own job. They're not listening to you when you're saying, look, you don't actually want to look at the source code, and even if you did, you definitely wouldn't want a hard copy. It's both dangerous for the IP of the company, and it's also stupid, because you can access it all online. What's the point? I don't think the guy in sales really wants to read all this source code. He just didn't understand what he was asking for. And as for the boss, he really didn't understand what he was asking for. I don't know if this was another inner machinations kind of thing going on with the boss, but yeah, he doesn't know what source code is. And even if he wasn't flabbergasted by a two inch thick binder of over 400 loose sheets of paper being plopped down on his desk out of the blue, I don't think he'd really understand anything that was in it anyway. People like to exercise power for the sake of power all the time, and I'm just glad that none of the people in the story were incompetent or dangerous enough to actually cost the company any serious damage. If someone has a heart attack on a plane, here's a quick lesson on how not to behave. About two years ago, I was flying to the east coast of the US from Houston. There was only one plane change in Atlanta. As we began our descent, there was some sort of commotion near the front of the plane as all of the flight attendants were clustered up there. After a few minutes, an announcement was made asking if there was a doctor on board. Sadly, there wasn't. Word slowly filtered back that it was a heart attack. When we got to the gate, there were paramedics waiting. Naturally, another announcement was made that due to a fellow passenger needing medical attention, there would be a significant delay in deplaning. As everyone was deplaning, the aisles were full of people waiting, but nobody seemed put out. That is, except Karen. Karen was a 50-ish woman in the seat behind me, and she was already in the aisle and muttering complaints about the delay. With every update from the captain, she let out another exasperated sigh and or muttered, unbelievable, you gotta be kidding me, under her breath. Even worse, when we finally did begin the deplaning, she actually tried to cut in front of me, breaking the cardinal rule of deplaning. People in front of you get off the plane before you. I whipped my arm out, smiled and said, excuse me. She scowled, backed up a few inches, and then this woman actually waved her hands hurry up at me. Okay, Karen. I took my time getting my bag, then stood on my toes to look in the baggage compartment in case anything fell out. I slowly walked to the front of the plane where the flight attendants and captains were saying goodbye and literally stopped, shook their hands, and thanked each one of them for the amazing job they did. I really appreciate your efforts, etc, etc. As soon as we were off the plane and in the sky bridge, Karen pushed her way around me and practically ran to the terminal. I walked in the middle to make it tougher on her. Screw you, Karen. Kind of interesting fun fact of the day, I was actually on a plane one time when a similar situation happened. Fortunately, it was not a heart attack, a man passed out likely due to dehydration and everything was able to be taken care of, 
but an interesting thing is that there were two nurses on board at the time, and both of them were trying to assist the flight attendants in the medical issue this man was having. However, the flight attendants were asking these women, do you have any identification proving that you're a nurse? I don't know if they needed a certificate or simply ID from a hospital or something of that sort, but both women had trouble producing such a document, which makes sense. They're nurses, so they want to help, but at the same time, they're on a plane, likely coming back or to a vacation, maybe visiting family, who knows what. Not really an I'm a nurse, this exact moment kind of mode. Now, I looked it up because I didn't know what the regulations regarding legal liability was as far as doctors, nurses, whoever helping people in the air. It turns out both that there's significant legal coverage if you put in a good faith effort into helping whatever medical situation is occurring, and that you don't have to identify yourselves in any formal manner. Oftentimes crew, like in this flight, will ask you for identification, but you're not required by any FAA or legal standard to supply such documentation, which I thought was pretty interesting. I think part of the reason for those kinds of rules are that, well, you're in a metal tube thousands of feet above the ground. Even if the pilot's able to divert the plane in the event of a serious medical emergency, it might be too late. You really have to utilize all available resources on board, and that includes personnel. In this case, a potential doctor or nurse on board. And beyond that, Karen, you need to let them do their job. You need to let people help other people, whether it's a nurse, a doctor, or another flight attendant just trying to help the person having a medical emergency way up in the sky where nobody else can help them. You can't call for an ambulance. I'm sorry, Karen, that your deplaning experience was mildly inconvenienced, but that's no right for you to break the cardinal rule of deplaning as OP stated. You always, no matter what, let the people who are sitting in front of you go first. Since you want to judge me for taking the second floor, have fun waiting for the elevator. I was waiting at the elevators. Didn't take too long since my apartment building is not that big. I get inside, and right when the door closes, a hand pushes through. She looked like your typical middle-aged Karen. She presses the 17th floor, and she takes one look at my floor, which was the second. She scoffs, glares at me, and says, The second floor? Really? Didn't take much to piss me off. Her comment was so unnecessary and uncalled for. Who cares if it was the second floor? It's my decision whether to take the stairs or not. I just finished an overnight shift and I was exhausted. I guess my exhaustion made me extra moody because when I reached my floor, she was scrolling through her phone. I quickly run my hands through as many buttons as I could and said, have fun Karen, right when the door closes. And because I was exhausted, therefore extra moody and petty, I pressed the up button when the elevator barely reached the third floor so I can use the other elevator and press a bunch of buttons again to further inconvenience her just in case she decided to get off on the third floor and to take the other elevator. Take the stairs then if it's not that big of a deal. Just don't be so rude to your neighbors for riding the elevators to the second floor. You don't know if they're exhausted or if they have non-visible health conditions that make it hard for them to take the stairs. Right, so uh, one, don't be an asshole. And two, if you're going to be an asshole, be an asshole in your own mind. You don't need to say that out loud. You can just think about it. Think really hard about it when you're in the elevator. Think about how horrible this person is for inconveniencing you 30 seconds by taking the elevator to the second floor. Then when you get up to your apartment, complain to your loved one. Complain to your friends. Post on your Instagram stories, some dumbass took the elevator to the second floor. This is why America's going to trash. But please, don't be an asshole to their face. Thank you to everyone who watched this video. Be sure to subscribe for more daily Reddit content. Drop a like if you like the video, and I will see you all tomorrow.